excited about it. If we take a particular one, like uh, which at the fir at first sight is difficult, like why do we enjoy music, say? Uh, how, how would you go about giving a functional explanation for that? Yeah, I, I don't think everything has a functional explanation. In fact, it's pretty important that not everything have a functional explanation or it would be too easy. I think a proper functional explanation has to start with some kind of engineering analysis, completely independent of what we know about human beings or whatever the organism is. So let's take, for example, stereo vision, the ability to combine the images from the two eyes to get an impression of depth. One can do a bit of geometry on a piece of paper and show why it would make sense to combine the images from two cameras at slightly different vantage points. And indeed, if one were to build a, a robot that had to na navigate an environment, it would make sense to build in stereo vision. We could look at the design specs for a, a stereo vision system, then bring our human being into the lab, look at how human stereo vision works, and see how well the design specs from the engineering analysis match up with what we empirically observe in humans. The closer the fit, uh, the more confidence that we have that the function of uh, stereo vision is to see in depth. When you don't have the engineering analysis, when you just observe that something is present in humans, it's, it, it is uh, impossible, I think, to make a proper functional or adaptationist explanation. And music might be an example. As, much, as important as music is in our lives, as much pleasure as it gives us, as much use we, we uh, uh, give it in social circumstances, it's completely unclear to me why it would have to be music that would do any of those things. Why would uh, notes in certain rhythmic and harmonic relations be a solution to any engineering problem? And it's possible, uh, and it's an empirical issue, that uh, music is actually a byproduct of other adaptations. Perhaps our sensitivity to speech, a harmonically rich sound that the brain has to analyze into its frequency components in order to understand speech, perhaps a byproduct of emotional calls that uh, go way back in, in uh, primate evolutionary history, sighs, moans, laughs, cries, and so on, possibly a byproduct of motor control, keeping your uh, bodily actions at a constant optimal rhythm. And maybe what music does is it combines bits and pieces of all these other parts of the brain, packs them into a supernormal stimulus, something that actually presses our buttons harder than anything in the, in the natural environment would, and we enjoy it. Uh, at least that's another hypothesis, and it shows not everything has to be an adaptation. Let's see if I've got that right. You're, you're saying that in order to analyze speech, the brain has to have certain mechanisms for taking frequencies, analyzing harmonics and things. Otherwise, we couldn't tell the difference between, say, vowel sounds. I mean, the difference between ah and oo and er is that that's not in itself musical. But the same software mechanisms, the same brain mechanisms that you need in order to tell whether you've got an ah, an er, uh, or an oo, can't help being supernormally stimulated by, uh, say, pure tones or uh, n notes that stay the same for a long time, or harmonies, chords, uh, harmonious chords. Whether, is, is that something like what, what you're saying? Yes, exactly. Uh, at least it's certainly a, a viable hypothesis, and I think it's more plausible than any hypothesis that tries to find some function in, in uh, music. Okay. And, the, and, and the sense of rhythm, uh, would that also come from speech, or do you think that might, I mean, the, the enjoyment of rhythm, do you think yeah. that comes from speech, or does that come from somewhere else? I suspect it comes more from motor control. And yes. it is significant that, in, uh, as far as I know, in all cultures, people move to music. They, they dance, they clap, they snap, they sway. And certainly, uh, for many kinds of, of uh, motor activities, there is an optimal rhythm, depending on the impedance of, the, of your body and the work, uh, pounding, running, uh, scraping. Because our limbs are sort of natural pendulums and, and that, that kind of thing. Exactly. Yes. And so uh, I think one would build into any uh, robotic system uh, a, uh, an ability to do something at a particular rhythm, perhaps even a pleasure in finding the optimal rhythm, and it's possible that music taps into that. Now, I, I've got to add that people in music hate this theory. Oh, really? They, <laughs> they are ultra-adaptationists, They, I think because of a confusion. So I think there's a confusion between adaptation in the technical sense of biology, namely a trait that, compared to alternatives, 
enhance the rate of reproduction of, of our ancestors. That's what a biologist means by an adaptation. In everyday conversation, if something's adaptive, it means it's, it's healthy, it's valuable, it, it allows you to, to improve, uh, it makes life worth living. And, and of course, music is all those things, but it's just a different sense of adaptation. Life enhancing. Yes. Life enhancing, exactly. Yes. And I like to say that it's, it's a mistake to equate adaptation in the biologist sense, which is what we were just talking about, with what is worthy in life. In fact, they're often at cross purposes. So reading, for example, which is almost certainly not an adaptation, because it just appeared it too recently in human yeah. uh, evolutionary history for it to, left, to have left its mark on the genome, is one of the things that makes life worth living. It's not an adaptation. And one could argue perhaps genocide is an adaptation, that uh, one tribe, uh, whenever it's convenient and has the means, will wipe out another tribe that could have been selected for, and of course that is uh, something like we detect, <laughs> not like enhancing. <laughs> These theories you've been putting forward are what you might call byproduct theories, and I think it's very important not to forget about byproducts whenever we're giving adaptive explanations. It's so easy to say, to pick on something that the animal we're looking at does and say, what's the good of that? And so often it turns out that actually it's not, that's not what's good for anything, but that the underlying mechanisms or the, the underlying something that's producing that thing is also producing something else and so in this case you're saying that that music or the enjoyment of music is a almost an inevitable byproduct of speech analyzing mechanisms and so we, we've always got to think byproduct when we're uh, dealing with adaptation explanations and maybe that's often an answer to the many rather virulent criticisms that we get in evolutionary psychology that, that the critics are not thinking byproduct, and they don't think that we're thinking byproduct. Would that be fair, do you think? Uh, absolutely. And in fact, I don't think one could make an argument that anything is an adaptation unless one had, as an alternative, uh, an uh, explanation such as that it's a, by a byproduct or arose by chance. That's what gives the field uh, its empirical content.